These are fragments of one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The scroll they were originally part of contained a copy of the collection of biblical literature commonly referred to as the Minor Prophets. This scroll is somewhere around 2,025 years old. And this tiny fragment is the only piece of it remaining that contains any of the book of Habakkuk. As it turns out, these few ancient Hebrew letters here are from the first line of the verse we are interested in, that is verse 4 of chapter 2. In the Babylonian Talmud, Ravi Nachman Bar Yaakov asserts that the 613 commandments of the Torah are summed up by this single verse of scripture. And this verse is quoted directly in three places in the New Testament. The Romans 117 quotation of this verse was thematic and foundational to the theology of the Protestant Reformation. So it can be said that this passage of scripture holds great significance in both Judaism and Christianity. The oldest complete copy of this piece of literature that we have is found in the Aleppo Codex. It's not quite as old as the fragment from the scroll 4Q82. This copy is only about 1,105 years old. And here is verse 4 of chapter 2. Now, scholars have bemoaned the many significant challenges that present themselves when it comes to translating this verse into English. Richard Patterson, in his exegetical commentary, remarks, Verse 4 confronts the reader with a myriad of grammatical and lexical difficulties. Yeah, this is a bit of an understatement. And Kenneth Turner, in his exegetical commentary, perhaps more appropriately, states, This verse is a text-critical nightmare. The difficult textual issues that we have with this verse is why there's so much variance among popular English translations. Now, I am under no illusion that a middling scholar such as myself will be able to offer any definitive solutions here. But I can at least show you why this verse is so difficult to turn into English. And due to the challenges that we have with this verse, I felt it best to break this into two parts. First, in this video, we're going to walk through a translation of this verse as it appears here in the Aleppo Codex. And then in a follow-up video, we're going to look at some of the reception history. But before we do all that, as always, let's begin with some context. In most of the prophetic books of the Hebrew Bible, the prophets are introduced with some biographical information. Here in the book of Habakkuk, we have none of that. The book is essentially two poems. Given the musical terminology used, we can surmise that the way people would have originally encountered the content of this book is by hearing it performed as songs. From the headings of each of the poems, we see that they are attributed to a man named Habakkuk. Beyond that, he is an enigmatic figure. We're not even sure if he was even from Israel or Judah. His name may not even be Hebrew. We just don't know. The only clue we have as to a probable time frame for this book is the mention of the rise of Hakastim, which is typically transliterated as the Chaldeans. Historians would know them as the Kassites. They were a people group who lived in lower Mesopotamia around the city of Babylon. The term is most often used to refer to people ruled over by Nebuchadnezzar II. So what is being referred to here in the book of Habakkuk is most likely the rise of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Look at the nations and see. Be astonished. Be astounded, for a work is being done in your days that you would not believe if you were told. For I am rousing the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. The traditional way to read this book is that Habakkuk was a prophet living in or around Jerusalem before the Battle of Carchemish, which was the event that marked the demise of the Neo-Assyrian Empire and the rise of the Neo-Babylonian. So a plausible way that the book of Habakkuk, as it is in our Bibles, came to be was that there was a prophet living in Jerusalem around the end of the 7th century BC who composed the two poems of the book. These would have been passed on into the post-exilic period, and since what he had prophesied turned out to be true, it would have been recognized as scripture, whereas exactly who this prophet was and where he came from would have possibly have been forgotten by then. Hence why the book does not have the standard biographical information that we find in the other prophetic literature. The first of the two poems of this book is referred to as Hamasa, and the second is a Tefala, 
and the first of the two poems is a back-and-forth conversation between the prophet and Yahweh. The prophet's initial complaint is that he sees injustice all around him, and he wants Yahweh to intervene and punish the unjust. Yahweh responds by letting the prophet in on his plan to use the invading Kazdim army as the instrument to bring justice. Havakuk didn't like Yahweh's answer, because the Kazdim were a people even more corrupt and unjust than the people he was initially complaining about, so he complains further. He accuses God of not caring that the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he. By using an invading army as an instrument of judgment means that the innocent in the land will suffer along with the guilty. In the prophet's response to Yahweh, there is a subtext of accusing him of being indifferent to the guilt or innocence of individuals. He complains that God is treating people like fish that are caught indiscriminately in a net. Yahweh responds to the prophet's second complaint. He tells Habakkuk, to be patient and trust him. Yahweh promises that he will punish the invading Kazdim as well. And not only that, there will be a time when he will deal with all human evil. So the answer to the prophet's complaint is yes, God will judge the corrupt people that the prophet was initially complaining about, and he will eventually bring judgment on the invading Kazdim as well. This section of the text takes the form of a series of curses or woes. There is a very eschatological tone to this, for it is not just about God bringing judgment on the evil of Habakkuk's day, but it extends to all humanity. And when this final judgment takes place, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. In the second poem of the book, the prophet reiterates what was revealed to him in his conversation with Yahweh found in the first poem. He describes Yahweh's promise to deal with human evil that is the evil the prophet was initially complaining about, as well as that of the invading army that is being used as the instrument of that initial judgment. He also describes what it means to remain faithful to Yahweh in such times, that is, in times when one is surrounded by the suffering due to human evil. Our verse is here in Yahweh's response to the prophet's second complaint, and it is here we run into a significant challenge. That is, the question of how verse 4 of chapter 2 fits into its immediate context. Does it belong in the paragraph with verses 1 through 3? Or does it belong with verses 5 through 20? Determining its immediate context does impact its meaning, and of course, how it should be translated. Scholars are divided on which it is. In fact, the two text-critical commentaries I quoted at the start of this video each take opposing views on this. Looking at the authorized version, or more commonly referred to as the King James Version. In this original 1611 printing, you can see the paragraph marker is at verse 5, putting verse 4 with 1 through 3. And in this later printing of the King James Version, the paragraph marker has moved to verse 4. There is really not much consistency at all among English translations when it comes to the question of in which paragraph does this verse belong. And there's a whole lot of variance when it comes to how to actually translate it. Interestingly, the translators of the English Standard Version decided not to commit to either on this one. They just left verse 4 floating out there by itself, not part of either paragraph. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up, it is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol, like death he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations. He collects as his own all peoples. Now we're going to work through the Hebrew syntax and grammar of verse 4, and then we will return to this question of the immediate context of this verse. And you'll see how, depending on how you answer that question, it will affect the translation.
Now returning to our manuscript, here we read, Hine upla lo yashra nefsho bo, wisadik pe amu natho yich ye. We have two lines of poetry which make up the two main clauses of this verse. The separation of these clauses is indicated by this conjunction and this cantillation mark here, called an atnach. All right, let's give ourselves some space to work. Hine is a demonstrative particle. It is an interjection. It is sometimes used in prophetic literature to introduce a vision or oracle. In prose, it is mostly confined to calling attention to some fact that requires action. It can also indicate a hypothetical expressing the idea of possibility. So we can go with the simple behold, or possibly a if there is, depending on the context. I'll put both down for now. Upla is a verb from the root afail. Figuring out the meaning of this word is rather challenging, because besides its use here, there's only one other place in the Hebrew Bible that refined this verb. That is, in Numbers 14.44, where it is describing the actions of some Israelites that went out to battle against the Amalekites and Canaanites when Moses had told them that Yahweh had forbidden it. So the idea behind this word seems to be presumption, in the sense of thinking you know better. It also seems to carry the idea of disregarding instruction, so to ignore, or more precisely, to show heedlessness. Now, when you look this word up in most biblical Hebrew lexicons, you find two entries listed, one being the verb to be heedless, and the other meaning literally to swell or to puff up, with a figurative meaning of to be in a state of pride and arrogance. And all these lexicons list the Habakkuk 2 passage as being this one, and the Numbers 14 passage as being this one. The thing is, we really don't have enough information to know which of these it is in our verse here. An argument can be made for either one. And this is further complicated by the fact that this is a unique spelling. Here, the verb appears to be a pu'al perfect third-person feminine singular. The pu'al verb stem means the action is in a passive voice. I'll put down both literal meanings for now. So she is being puffed up, or she is being heedless. Lo is a negation, and yashra is a verb from the root yasher, meaning to make straight or right. It can be used in the ethical sense of upright or straightforward. This word could also mean smooth or pleasant, and figuratively as being pleased. In the context of describing a disposition or a relationship, it can mean something like copacetic. It is a call, perfect third-person feminine singular. So she is not upright, or she is not pleased. Like the previous verb, I'll put down both for now. Nafsho is the feminine singular noun, nefesh, and the third-person masculine singular possessive pronoun. The noun nefesh literally means throat, although it is almost always used metaphorically as that aspect of humans that has desires, like hunger or thirst. It can also be used to refer to the idea of a person's life, simply because a dead body has no desires or motivations. It is lifeless. For example, in the story of the death of Rebecca, it was at the departing of her nefesh that she died. Or when God forms the human, the human to a nefesh, a living one. It is in this sense that nefesh overlaps a little bit with the meaning of the English word soul, or at least in the older sense of that word. Nowadays, the word soul has a very wide range of meanings, all somewhat ambiguous. Here, in the context of this verse, it is fairly clear, because of the verbs used, that we are talking about the motivations and desires, or disposition and attitude, of a person. So we will go with a literal rendering of his desire. And since this noun is singular and feminine, it agrees with our two verbs. So this is the subject of our clause. Bo is the preposition be, meaning in, with, or by, and the pronoun. So we can go with in him or it, or with him or it. I'll put both down for now. Wa is the conjunction, typically rendered and. Or since this verse is a contrast, we can go with but. Or we can even just leave it untranslated. Its function is to mark the separation of the two clauses of this verse. Sadiq is an adjective meaning just or righteous, in the sense of conduct and character. And here it is a substantive adjective, that is, it's functioning as a noun. 
so a righteous one. Be is the preposition in, with, or by, and this is the noun, amuna, meaning something like faithfulness in the sense of loyalty. It conveys the idea of being constant or steadfast in the face of opposition. The word is often used synonymous with chesed. Chesed specifically refers to loyalty in the context of a covenant, whereas amuna is loyalty in a more general sense. Now, etymology isn't always helpful when trying to work out the meaning of a word. At least it shouldn't be given anywhere near as much weight as things like context and usage. The standard example of this would be noting that the English word butterfly has nothing to do with dairy products. But in the case of our word here, looking at its etymology does provide some insight into its meaning. In ancient Hebrew, the vast majority of words are built on a triconsonantal lemma. If you take the lemma, aleph, mem, nun, as a simple verb in the call stem, you get the word meaning to be trustworthy, established, or dependable. In the hifil stem, you get believe, trust, or to put faith in. When used adverbally, as an interjection, you get the word amen, which is an affirmation of what is declared, an acceptance of a thing as being true. As a participle, you get standing firm, unwavering, or believing. Some examples of nouns derived from this same root would be this word meaning firmness, faithfulness, or truth, that is truth in the objective sense. And you also get nouns like this meaning loyalty or trustworthiness in the sense of being dependable or adhering to a standard, or meaning a binding written agreement, a regulation, a prescription commanded by an authority. And we have our word found in our verse, the noun amuna, although typically translated faithfulness, because of its association with all of these ideas of truth, belief, and reliability, some translations go with fidelity, just like a high-fidelity audio recording is meant to be a truthful or faithful representation of the sound that it is a recording of. When this word is used for describing human behavior, there is an archaic English word that we can use here. That is fealty, like a knight in the Middle Ages swearing an oath of fealty to his lord. Although this works for human actions, this word can also be used to describe God's actions. So for us, I think a simple rendering of loyalty will work here. Just keep in mind that it is loyalty with the assumption that it is based on an objective truth. So an action in alignment with objective reality, or a believing loyalty. And this word has the third person masculine possessive pronoun. So his loyalty. And we should take this be as a preposition of instrumentality. So we can go with by means of his loyalty. Yichya is a verb from the root chaya, meaning to live, and it is a call in perfect third person masculine singular. So we have he will live. All right, now I'm just going to point out some of the grammatical oddities that we find in this verse. Looking at this first clause, right off, we have an atypical spelling. Hine is normally spelled simply hain. There are other occurrences of this spelling, but it's definitely not the norm. And we see the two verbs here are both feminine and singular, which indicates that desire is the subject. But this syntax is a bit bizarre. This double verb, with one being in a passive voice and the other being in an active voice, is atypical of Hebrew. Well, it's probably atypical of any language, really. And the Masoretic scribe that created this manuscript noted this word as being the only occurrence of this spelling in the entire Hebrew Bible. And this in him is strange as well. A nefesh is not normally spoken of as being in a person, although there's a lot of other things this preposition can mean. And the big question with this clause is, what is the antecedent to this possessive pronoun? Whose desire is this? Or whose soul are we even talking about here? Now, looking at the second clause, there's some issues here as well. The obvious antecedent to this possessive pronoun is the masculine singular, a righteous one. Although it is strange that it's even here, it is superfluous. If it wasn't here, it would still mean the loyalty of a righteous one. Another thing that's atypical here is the verb being at the end of the clause. In Biblical Hebrew, verbs are typically at the beginning, although this is not that strange to find this sort of thing in poetry. So, to translate this verse coherently, we need to make some choices. First, we need to return to the question of what paragraph does this verse go with? 
did the author intend it to be part of the introduction of the vision of verses 1 through 3, or is it meant to be part of the vision itself, describing the invading Kazdim and the prophesying of their eventual fate in verses 5 through 20? Let's first consider the option of it belonging with verses 5 through 20 and being part of the vision itself. Then this first clause is a description of the invading Kazdim army, which is then contrasted with the righteous in the second clause. So this pronoun, his, is a personification of the Kazdim, in which case for this word we can go with puffed up in the figurative sense of arrogant, or even literally as swollen describing the growth of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, like a cancerous tumor as it spreads beyond its borders, assimilating the surrounding nations. In this word we can go with not upright, as in corrupt. So we can reasonably render this, behold, puffed up, corrupt is his desire in him but a righteous one by his loyalty will live. A couple of things that suggest that this is how the author intended this to be read is first, the use of the interjection, hinna. This suggests, although not always, that this is the start of a new section with a new subject, meaning instead of looking for the antecedent of this pronoun in what preceded it, it is the subject of the new section. And second, the use of nefesho, or his desire, is repeated and expanded upon further in the very next verse. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples, he being the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Although confusingly, the English Standard Version here translates nefesho as his soul in verse 4 and in verse 5 as his greed. Now, let's consider the possibility that our verse belongs with verses 1 through 3. And since we are translating from the Aleppo Codex, this is the option we're going to go with. Because as you can see, in this manuscript, the scribe grouped verse 4 with verses 1 through 3. There is a clear break after verse 4. This seems to be the consensus of Masoretic manuscripts. The only exception being the Leningrad Codex, which groups all of chapter 2 into a single block of text for some reason. With verse 4 being part of the introduction to the vision, this means that this first clause, instead of describing the invading Kazdim, is describing those who do not believe the vision, that is, those who have lost faith that it will ever come to pass. So these are people who do not believe God will ever bring justice and have fallen into the sin of despair. In the Masoretic text, there are some other bits of information that the scribe included that are of some help to us. Normally, when reading the Hebrew Bible, you don't need the vowel pointing or the cantillation marks in order to make sense of what you are reading. But with a difficult passage like we are dealing with, every scrap of data is valuable. With the Masoretic text, we are dealing with the Tiberian system of scribal markings. I have already pointed out the atnach. Now here, on the accent of this word, we see what is called a zekefkaton. It suggests a stop or a slight pause in the reading, marking the separation of subordinate clauses. This leads us to render this, if there is heedlessness, not pleased, his desire or soul with it, he being Yahweh. And likewise, it may be best to read this pronoun with Yahweh as the antecedent as well, because if it was the faithfulness of a righteous one, then there would be no need for the pronoun even being here. So, taking the Zekef Katon as acting like a comma in English means it is suggesting that this is a subordinate clause. This reading makes sense out of the double verb with the different voicing. And speaking of a nefesh or soul as a way of talking about someone's disposition is a standard Hebrew turn of phrase. So we get, if there is heedlessness, his soul is displeased with it, but a righteous one by his faithfulness will live. In the context of verses 1 through 3, Yahweh is telling Habakkuk about the vision he's going to receive. This verse is then a contrast between, on the one hand, those who have lost faith, not believing the vision, not remaining loyal to Yahweh, and on the other hand, those Yahweh counts as righteous, that is, those who live by trusting him to do what he said, even when it doesn't seem like things are moving in the direction of justice from one's own myopic perspective. In this antithetical parallelism, those who are disloyal are juxtaposed with Yahweh's faithfulness, and the ones he is displeased with are juxtaposed with the ones he counts as righteous. 
So to make this contrast a bit clearer in English, I would offer this paraphrase of this verse. He is displeased with faithlessness, but the righteous are those who live by his faithfulness. From the prophet's point of view, his complaint was that he saw injustice all around him and he wanted God to do something about it. God's response was to reveal to him the bigger picture, which for Habakkuk and the people living in and around Jerusalem meant things were about to get exponentially worse. By worse, we mean going from the suffering due to the evil immediately around them to enduring the suffering that comes with a military invasion. So we're talking about the death of a large number of people and the burning of cities, the tearing down of temples, disease, starvation, and the displacement of portions of the population. So in short, the desolation of the nation. So God's answer to the prophet's complaint is yes. God is going to bring justice to the world, but it involves the unfolding of events reaching into both Habakkuk's past and into his future, spanning millennia, and the rising up and disposing of giant world-dominating empires that God is moving around like pawns on a chessboard. So even though the answer is essentially an unequivocal yes for Habakkuk, the immediate future looks rather bleak. So with this verse, the author is warning his readers not to despair, not to lose heart. God will bring the justice he promised, even though the current circumstance makes it seem like the opposite. And for the righteous, this verse is an encouragement to continue trusting that God will do what he said, an encouragement to maintain one's believing loyalty, even though there are dark days ahead. Now, this verse, as we have rendered it into English here, is only a translation of the text as it appears in this particular manuscript. Even though this is probably the best we can do, there is still some significant issues with it. So in a follow-up video, we're going to talk about some of those issues, as well as look at ancient translations of this verse. And we'll look at a little bit of the reception history of this passage, specifically how it was interpreted in the first century. So we have a situation where, due to the grammar and syntax being uncertain, we have somewhat of a low level of confidence in our translation. But, due to the historical and literary contexts doing the heavy lifting when it comes to understanding the meaning, we can have a significant level of confidence that we understand what this passage was meant to communicate. The wider literary context of the book gives us even more confidence that what the author is saying to his readers is that Yahweh is displeased with those who lose faith and recognizes the righteous as those who remain loyal even during suffering. In the second poem of the book of Habakkuk, the prophet paints a poetic picture of what this believing loyalty looks like. I trembled inside when I heard this. My lips quivered with fear. My legs gave way beneath me, and I shook in terror. I will wait quietly for the coming day when disaster will strike the people who invade us. Even though the fig tree has no blossoms, and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails, and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields, and the cattle barns are empty. Yet I in Yahweh will rejoice. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation.